So the topic for today's discussion is uh, Lagrangian methods. And once again, we have uh, uh, we have talked about this several times. So we are looking for x bar and lambda bar such that gradient of the Lagrangian is zero and h of x bar is equal to zero. Okay, so this is what we would like to solve um, solve for. And so far we have come up with three different algorithms to try and come up with this uh, solution, which is barrier method. So number one was barrier method. Number two was augmented Lagrangian method and the method of multipliers. And the third one that we talked about on Monday was sequential quadratic programming, where we came up with a penalty function and we tried to do a global minimization of the penalty function through a sequential quadratic program. And it turns out that the global minimum of the fx plus cpx, the global minimum x in Rn is actually a solution to the original problem. Okay, so today uh, we are going to talk about Lagrangian methods, which is let's try to concoct an iterative scheme. Okay, to so that the at the limit of that iterative scheme we have we have these two properties, and then try and go about proving that that iterative scheme converges. Okay, so it's a two step process. First, decide, design an iterative scheme such that the limit satisfies these two conditions. And then the second step would be to prove that such an iterative scheme is uh, leads to convergence under a fairly mild set of assumptions. So let's try to design the first iterative scheme not the first, actually, this is the only iterative scheme we will talk about, but there are lots of other iterative schemes in the book uh, in, in that particular section on Lagrangian methods. So the iterative scheme is as follows. I'm going to design, let xk plus one be xk minus alpha gradient of the Lagrangian. And I will update lambda k plus one as HXK. Okay, this is my iterative scheme. What would the, suppose this iterative scheme converges, let's say this converges to X bar and Lambda bar. What would be satisfied at X bar and Lambda bar? Okay, so let's look at the first expression. So I have X bar, so I let limit K goes to infinity on both the sides of the equality. So I have X bar equals to X bar minus alpha, X bar lambda bar. So this implies that the first derivative of the Lagrangian is equal to zero. And let's say my lamp, so I take limit K goes to infinity in the second equation. So I get lambda bar Okay, so by taking the limit k goes to infinity on both the sides, I conclude that if this set of iterations converge, 
then it must converge to a point which satisfies the first order necessary conditions for optimality. For the constrained optimization problem. This is of course a quality constraint problem that we are talking about. Any questions so far? Okay, so what's the what's the intuition here? So you basically stared at this equation for a very long time. Um, and you wanted to make sure that you come up with an iterative scheme so that the limit satisfies these two conditions. So you, you stared at this equation for a long time and then you came up with this iterative scheme. And you realize that in fact, if this iterative scheme converges, I actually, this, this actually implies that it satisfies the two first order necessary conditions for optimality. So that's good. Now the question is, does this iterative scheme converge? Question. Does this converge? Okay. And we would like to answer this question in today's class. How should we go about proving the, that such an iterative scheme would converge? What do you think should be, could be a possible approach for this problem? So someone who has done the homework, homework assignment four should be able to have some idea about how should we go about proving this result. So has anyone tried homework four? Can we can make a state space representation of uh, extent uh, of a state extend lambda uh, okay. lambda such that the spectral radius will be less than one for the a. We will you can say that it's converges. That's what we did in the homework. That's right. So that was a linear problem. So the Lagrangian and everything was linear, uh, linear quadrat. So the gradient of the Lagrangian was linear and the and, and H was linear. So you could just create a state space representation of X and Lambda. And you could write it as So if everything is linear, you could actually write it as a X K Lambda K plus B, right? This is what you did in, in assignment four. And then you know that if spectral radius of A, so if rho of A is less than one, then this iteration would converge to X bar lambda bar, right? So by looking at the spectral radius of this linear map, um, you're able to deduce the convergence of an iterative scheme. So the goal for today's class is to extend this approach to this nonlinear setting that, oh, not this one. This nonlinear setting, this nonlinear iterations that we have defined just now. And the tool that we are going to use is called Banach Contraction Mapping Theorem. So it's a generalization of, of this result to nonlinear settings.
okay any question so far i mean uh, so so one thing i wanted to let you know i'm extremely excited about this theorem all the time so so i have written several papers on contraction mapping theorem and and you know uh, its application to optimization and reinforcement learning so i'm really very uh, passionate about this topic of contraction mapping theorem and you will see the passion today in this class okay banap contraction mapping theorem so let me recall some uh, some definition so i have to first go over several definitions before i um, state the theorem so the first definition that i want to recall from one of the i think lecture 1 or lecture 2 is cauchy sequence so i have a sequence xk in rn is said to be a cauchy sequence if for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an epsilon such that xk minus xm norm so this could be any norm on rn is less than epsilon for all km greater than equal to n epsilon let's look at a pictorial example of a cauchy sequence so this is my k which is the sequence uh, the index of the sequence this is my xk so this is my rn and here are my points okay this is my set of points so this is my x1 x2 x3 x4 and so on and what this definition of cauchy sequence is saying that if i pick an epsilon greater than 0 i can find a tail of the sequence so let's say the tail of the sequence is so i pick epsilon greater than 0 let's say this is the tail of the sequence such that if i pick any two points let's say i pick this point and i pick this point in the tail oh sorry this point doesn't belong to the tail if i pick this point in the tail and i pick this other point in the tail i take the difference between the two take the norm of the difference it's less than epsilon so this distance is less than epsilon for any two points within this tail okay so i'm just looking at the tail of the sequence and i'm looking at any two points in the tail of the sequence and i look at the difference between the norm of the difference between the two and it's always smaller than epsilon okay and as i make the value of epsilon smaller and smaller the the tail that i'm going to pick that n epsilon the value of n epsilon will increase okay as we let epsilon go to zero so one of the essential theorems in uh, real analysis is that cauchy sequence has a limit so if xk is a cauchy sequence 
So this is something we had talked about in lecture one. So we know the following result. If XK is Cauchy, XK converges to X bar. So there is a limit X bar and XK would converge to that limit X bar. So there are actually two results embedded here. First is that XK converges and the point would be in Rn itself. It won't go to infinity. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions on the definition of Cauchy sequence? Let's move on to the second definition. Uh, contraction map. So T from Rn to Rn is a contraction map if and only if there exist alpha Oh, I've used, I'm using alpha already. Um, beta, we have not used beta, right? Yeah, we have not used beta. Beta in zero one. So this is closed. So this is a clopen interval. So zero is included, but one is not included. There ex exists beta between zero and one such that Tx minus Ty is less than equal to beta x minus y for all x, y in Rn. Okay. You can also think of beta as the Lipschitz coefficient, which I'm sure you are familiar with. So this is beta would be the Lipschitz coefficient of the map T and T could be arbitrary nonlinear map. As long as it has a Lipschitz coefficient that's less than one, then it's a contraction map. So what's this contraction mapping theorem is telling us? So this is my Rn and I pick two points, X1 and X2, and I map it under the influence of T. So I get Tx1 and Tx2, okay, so these are the uh, mappings of X1 and X2 under the influence of T. And I look at this distance, and I look at this distance, this distance is always less than or equal to beta times X1 minus X2. That's the meaning of contraction mapping. Uh, that's the meaning of a contraction map. So the distance between Tx1 and Tx2 is smaller than the distance between X1 and X2. But it's not just small, it's small by a factor of beta.
okay. Now, of course, uh, you can define the contraction map over the entire space of Rn, but many a times you would just like to concentrate on a smaller subset of Rn, so you can just replace this by the subset X itself. Okay, where X is any closed subset of Rn. So you don't necessarily need T to be map mapping uh, a, a vector to a vector um, as as long as it maps from a set to the set itself, uh, you, are, you should be okay. It shouldn't go out of the set. Okay, I'm going to pause here for question. Do you have any question on Cauchy sequence or contraction map? So Professor, if we're relating this, I'm just trying to relate this to the assignment, um, the contraction mapping, if you right. have a state space of uh, the, the Lagrange multiplier. Right. So that would basically map um, the Lagrange multiplier by T, right? using the contraction map T. Correct, yeah. okay. correct, yes. So all the, uh, the, the proof that you did was through this contraction mapping argument. So when rho of A, so what you can prove is that if rho of A is less than one, so the spectral radius of A matrix A is less than one, then it's mm. a contraction map. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's a good point. Let me just write it. So your T of X is AX plus B. And if rho of A is less than one, then it implies that T is a contraction map. Okay. Uh, this is exactly the result you used in the assignment. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the proof of this result comes from your midterm problem one. So, so what you did in midterm problem one was to come up with a metric. Oh, this is actually the most important part. Now, remember I had said that this is this norm could be anything on Rn, right? Could be any norm on Rn. So it turns so it turns out that a map is a contraction under a specific norm. So you know if you change the norm, your mapping need not be a contraction anymore. Okay, so there has to be a specific norm along with the description of this operator T um, so, that the, so that T becomes a contraction operator under that norm. So midterm problem one gives you an example of a specific norm on the space of Rn such that T is a contraction. Um, you know, maybe let me take a detour. I just want to specify what is that norm. So let's say we have u du inverse. So A is diagonal diagonalizable matrix. U is the set of eigenvectors in the matrix form. D is a diagonal matrix. And U inverse is of course inverse of the eigen, eigenvector matrix. This is eigenvector, this is diagonals of eigenvalues. So what you showed in midterm problem one was if you pick the norm u inverse x1 or any p, let me just write any p. So under this norm, so this is the definition of norm t of x1 minus t of x2 is less than or equal to rho of a x1 minus x2. Okay, this is what you proved. And because rho of a was less than one, 
T is a contraction map. This is the T. Okay, so under this norm, T is a contraction map. Now, if you pick some other norm, T need not be a contraction map. Okay. So whether or, whether or not a map is a contraction is very much dependent on the norm you pick on the space. And under an appropriate norm, if you can show that T is a contraction, then you are in good shape. All right, does, does this uh, uh, example make sense? Any question on this, uh, this particular example? I know you have seen it in different bits and pieces, but hopefully this particular line of thought unifies all of the stuff that you have done so far on this topic. Okay, so this is my map T. Uh, let's say I have rho A is less than one. So the spectral radius of A is less than one. Uh, now my goal is to show that T is a contraction map. How do I do that? Well, I first need to pick a norm. So I pick a norm X, norm of X is norm of P norm of U inverse X. And you have showed it in your midterm that this is a valid norm and uh, that norm of tx1 minus norm of tx norm of tx1 minus tx2 is less than or equal to the spectral radius of a multiplied by norm of x1 minus x2. And because it's satisfied under this particular choice of norm, uh, this is t is a contraction map under this norm. Okay. Now we can go to the contraction mapping theorem. So let's say X in Rn is closed, set T from X to X is a contraction map. So X is a closed set, T is a contraction map and consider the sequence xk plus one equals to txk, x naught is in capital X. So I pick any x naught in capital X and I run this iteration, xk plus one equals to txk. Then xk converges to x bar and tx bar equals to x bar. So this is known as x bar is a fixed point. of capital T. And X bar is unique. Unique fixed point of capital T. So I have actually three results here. This is result A, this is result B, this is result C. Okay, I'll let you write and then we can discuss this result. So I have a closed set, 
I have a contraction map. I have a sequence that's generated from this contraction map starting with a point which is inside the set capital X. Turns out that if you look at this iterates that are generated from this uh, operator T, the iterates would converge to a point. That point is actually a fixed point of T, so which means that T of X bar is equal to X bar. Okay, so that's fixed point of T. And X bar is actually a unique fixed point of T. So no matter where you start, so let's say this is your set capital X, and you started from this initial condition X naught, and you converse to this point X bar, you start from this initial condition X naught, you would again converse to the same X bar. You started from this initial condition X naught, and you would again converse to the same fixed point. So no matter where you start within the set, there is a unique fixed point of T within this set capital X. And no matter from where you start, you will converge. This iterative scheme would converge to this fixed point X bar of T. Okay. Now, of course, uh, the result that we are talking about here is in terms of um, contraction maps over Euclidean space. But it turns out that this contraction mapping theorem is far more powerful and it actually works in infinite dimensional spaces as well. So not just Euclidean space, but if you are uh, looking into optimization problems over function spaces, you could still use contraction mapping theorem because it applies even in those settings, even in infinite dimensional settings. Okay. Now let's say you want to prove this theorem. How should you go about proving it? So I want to say that a sequence converges and we know that Cauchy sequence converges. So what could be a possible idea for proving this theorem? Any thoughts? Can you prove that the sequence is a Cauchy sequence? Great. So let's try to prove that. So we need to prove that XK is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, if we prove that XK is a Cauchy sequence, then I can show that it converges and then I can prove the B and C part pretty easily. Um, so let's just try to prove the more difficult part, which is part A, that the sequence is convergent. So in order to do that, we'll prove that XK is a Cauchy sequence. So I need to show that XK minus XK plus N, or let's say XK plus M, is less than or equal to epsilon. So no, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an epsilon such that this is less than epsilon for all k greater than equal to m n epsilon and m greater than equal to zero. This is what I need to prove. Let's look at this difference. Xk plus m minus xk. Xk plus m minus xk plus m minus one. Xk plus one minus xk. Okay, so I'm just using triangle inequality to 
to get this expression. What is this less than equal to? So let's look at this expression. This is less than equal to alpha times xk plus m minus one. Sorry, I used beta as the contraction parameter. So beta times norm of xk plus m minus one minus xk plus m minus two beta times xk plus m minus two xk plus m minus three beta times xk minus xk minus one so i see that there is some sort of pattern that's emerging out of this analysis. So let's try to exploit this pattern. So I'm getting the pattern that, uh, that this difference between two successive iterates is actually beta times the difference between the previous two successive iterates. And I can do this for each of these terms in this summation, right? So let's try and do it. Let's try and understand what this xk plus one minus xk looks like. So this is less than beta raised to, sorry, beta multiplied by xk minus xk minus one, which is less than beta square, xk minus one minus xk minus two. So I can continue this process because of the contraction mapping property. And what I can get is beta raised to k x1 minus x0. Okay, so this is an important result. So let's box it. what we just showed was that the difference between the two successive iterates is actually bounded by beta raised to k times the norm of x1 minus x0. Now I can use this inequality in the expression above, in the summation above, and I can get something really cool. So what do I get? Xk plus m minus xk is less than equal to, what do we get? Can someone compute it and tell me what we get on the right side of this equation? What would, what would be an upper bound on the norm of xk plus m minus, xk plus m minus one? What's an upper bound on this? Anyone wants to take a chance? Okay, well, this is beta raised to k plus m minus one, x one minus x zero plus beta raised to k plus m minus two, x one minus x zero, beta raised to k, x one minus x zero. That's what we get on the right side. of this inequality.
Okay, any questions so far? So now the bulk of the theorem is already proved just with this step. Okay, so we just had to, we had to figure out what's the difference between xk plus m minus xk is. So we use the triangle inequality so that we have difference between successive iterates. We identified that the difference between successive iterates satisfies certain property. Um, and we, we figured out what that property is, which is this term xk plus one minus xk is upper bounded by beta raised to k x one minus x zero. Now we just exploited this property back in the expression above to get this inequality. And this is less than equal to, I can take beta raised to k out and I have beta raised to m minus one, beta raised to m minus two plus beta raised to zero times x one minus x zero. Can someone tell me what would be an upper bound to this expression B? There is a pattern here, okay? Let's exploit that pattern and come up with an upper bound on this expression. What should I bound it by? Let me just take the infinite sum. So this is finite sum. This sums from beta raised to zero to beta raised to m minus one. But let me just extend it all the way to infinity. What is this equal to? Beta raised to k over one minus beta norm of x1 minus x0. Okay. So does this prove the theorem? Well, not really because what we need to show is for every epsilon greater than zero, I need to come up with an n epsilon such that this condition holds. I think this should be strictly less than. Uh, so this condition holds. So all we have done is we have come up with an upper bound on xk plus m minus xk. So let me get into that particular form. So let me pick epsilon greater than zero. And I'm going to pick n epsilon as, let me think, I want this to be less than epsilon. So epsilon over norm of x1 minus x naught times one minus beta. And then I have beta raised to K. So I need to put, sorry. Okay, let me try to do it in a reverse engineering way. So I want beta raised to N epsilon over one minus beta X one minus X naught to be less than epsilon. I can take log on both the sides then I have n epsilon log beta is less than log of epsilon one minus beta over norm of x one minus x naught. 
okay and this would imply I want my n epsilon to be larger than log of this epsilon 1 minus beta over x1 minus x0 over log of beta. So remember, beta is less than 1, so log of beta is negative. So when I take the log of beta on the other side, then the inequality reverses. So I get the value of n epsilon as something that's greater than this expression. This expression depends on norm of x1 minus x0 and it depends on the value of beta. So let me just pick n epsilon equals to ceiling of this whole thing plus one. This is just the usual mathematical trick. So I picked an epsilon greater than zero. I identified the value of an epsilon such that if my k is greater than this n epsilon, then my xk plus m minus xk is less than epsilon. Let me write it formally. So for epsilon greater than zero and n epsilon that comes from here, we have norm of xk plus m minus xk is less than equal to is strictly less than epsilon. For all k, greater than equal to n epsilon. Okay, so we have this specific result that we wanted. So we went through a bunch of inequalities to arrive at a specific value of n epsilon such that we can show that xk forms a Cauchy sequence. So, and we know that every Cauchy sequence in Rn converges. So therefore, xk must converge to some limit x bar. So this implies xk is a Cauchy sequence, which implies xk converges to x bar and moreover this implies that xk plus 1 equals to txk i can take the limit going to limit k goes to infinity on both the sides and i get x bar equals to tx bar so that was the second result x bar is a fixed point of t so we, we concluded both A and B. So this was result A, this was result B. And now we just need to show that X bar is a unique fixed point of T in the set capital X. Okay, so we have xk converging to x bar. x bar is a fixed point of t. Now let's say if x1 bar and x2 bar were fixed point of t, then such that norm of x1 bar minus norm of x2 bar were greater than zero. So which means that x1 bar is not equal to x2 bar, then I will have x1 bar minus x2 bar is equal to tx1 bar minus tx2 bar, which is less than equal to beta times 
x1 bar minus x2 bar. And remember, beta is between 0 and 1. So when can this inequality make sense? This inequality will only make sense if x1 bar was equal to x2 bar. So in other words, we arrive at a contradiction because if x1 bar was not equal to x2 bar, then the norm of x1 bar minus x2 bar must be less than equal to something that's smaller than one times the norm of x1 bar minus x2 bar doesn't make any sense. We have a contradiction. So therefore, x1 bar must be equal to x2 bar. So in other words, x bar is a unique fixed point of t. There are no other fixed points within this set capital X. So this was the most uh, mathematical part of this class where we had to prove Banach fixed point theorem in order to use it to establish convergence of optimization algorithms. And finally, we have been able to do that. So at least we have covered the Banach fixed point theorem. And in the next class, we are going to apply this theorem to show that the Lagrangian method we came up with here so this Lagrangian method actually converges to the fixed point of this expression. And the fixed point satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. So we'll cover that in the next class, you know. So let me just quickly go over what we did. Uh, you know, we did a lot of things in this class, but uh, I just want to quickly recap it. So we wanted to prove that XK is a Cauchy sequence. So XK generated by this contraction map is a Cauchy sequence. So we went through a bunch of steps to show that for a specific epsilon greater than zero, I can compute an N epsilon such that XK plus M minus XK is less than epsilon for all K greater than equal to N epsilon and M greater than equal to zero. So once we establish this result, then it becomes immediately clear that XK is a Cauchy sequence. We know from, uh, you know, calculus, not calculus, but real analysis class that a Cauchy sequence converges to a limit. That limit automatically becomes fixed point of T. And then we use the contraction property of T to show that there are no other fixed points. There is a unique fixed point in the sp space of capital X and no matter this is my space X. No matter where I start, my iterations would eventually converge to this X bar. So all roads leads to X bar. Okay, X bar is a unique fixed point of T. So that's all I have for this class. Uh, I'll be available for office hours uh, within like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions on what we did today, uh, you can ask me now, or if you have questions on the assignment, we could talk during the office hours. So any questions on what we did today? Professor, uh, can you please go to the beginning of the proof? Uh, when... Yes. Uh, uh, yes, professor, just here. Uh, uh, can you please uh, elaborate how, uh, like, what you uh, circled uh, in the red, how uh, you further broke it down into, uh, the, like, further uh, expanded it? This, this, is, uh, this step? Uh, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, you circled it, uh, some, uh, the first time in red. By uh, huh. the first term, and then you huh. expanded it in the next step. Like I'm unable right. to understand how it's done. So you you don't understand how it how someone came up with this idea or like uh, 
like how the norm of x k plus one minus x k plus m minus one is further expanded into norm of like, oh I see whatever is right greater. right right okay 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 that's great okay I understand your question okay so I have x k plus m minus x k plus m minus one this is equal to t of x k plus m minus one minus t of x k plus m minus two, right? So that's how we've defined the value of x k. It's t applied to the previous iterate. That's what gives you x k plus m and the same thing happens here. Then we applied the contraction condition of t and we get Okay. 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 Yeah. Professor. Yes. Uh, so normally, uh, in nonlinear case, how, like, uh, how, how do we know T is a contraction mapping? Like, uh, maybe in exercise, in normal case, you will tell us this is a contraction mapping or. Yes. So, right. So you oh, have a, so yes. we'll go over it in the next class when uh -huh. we talk about the contraction property of this iteration. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so I'll tell you how to recognize whether a map is a contraction map or not. <sighs> Excuse me. Yeah, there are some easy to check conditions which will allow you to infer whether a nonlinear map is a contraction map. In fact, I can tell you right now what we are going to do in the next class. And then next class is of course, just uh, uh, doing all the algebra. So if you have a mapping T from X to X and the gradient of T at X star is less than one. So you have this point X star, which is your point of interest. And the, so X star is a fixed point of T. X star is fixed point of T. And you know that the spectral radius of the gradient of T at X star is less than one. Then you can create a neighborhood around X star. So this is your capital X, such that T is a contraction within this space capital X, within this ball capital X around X star. Oh, I see. T is a contraction Thank you. in X. Now, of course, the norm has to be picked more appropriately. Okay, so the norm would depend on the eigenvectors of this gradient of T of X star. Okay, so the first derivative condition can allow you to infer the contraction property of the map T. All right, so if there are no further questions, I'll see you guys during my office hours in 10 minutes or so. <laughs>